is one of the strangest stories in the Bible. It's found in St. Mark chapter 14, and it is so strange that I think I'll simply read it as it is, and then we're going to study about what it means. The story occurs here as the centerpiece in three stories, and the two stories on the outside of the center, the beginning and the ending, are both uh, miserable, unhappy, bitter, sinful stories, really. And the one in the middle is absolutely beautiful. Makes me think of the three crosses in Calvary's Hill. Two thieves on each side and in the middle, the cross where the Savior was crucified. This is something like that. It starts off here with verse 1 telling how the chief priests and scribes sought how they might take Christ by craft and put him to death. And then it ends in verse 10 with Judas Iscariot, for some strange reason, making the decision to go to the chief priests to betray Jesus unto them. When they heard it, they were glad, promised to give him money, and he sought how he might conveniently betray him. Between those two miserable stories, there is a fantastically beautiful one. Verse 3, And being in Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, that is, he was having tea, I presume you say, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious. She broke the box and poured it on his head. And there were some that had indignation within themselves. And incidentally, uh, John, in telling the story, tells who the some were. First of all, Judas Iscariot, and then the disciples who followed his motion. And said, why was this waste of the ointment made? It might have been sold for more than 300 denarii. A denarius was the wage of a working man for a whole day. And 300 would be about a year's income and have been given to the poor and they murmured against her and Jesus said let her alone why trouble ye her she has wrought a good work on me and the word good in the Greek is kalos which means fantastic beautiful super marvelous you have the poor with you always and whensoever you will you may do them good but me you have not always she hath done what she could. She's come aforehand to anoint my body to the burial. Now in verse 9, Jesus makes this strange prediction here that is so hard to understand. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. And Jesus said nothing like that about anybody else at any time. The gospel is what he did. The gospel is the whole story of Jesus. He is the center figure, the hero all the way through. And at no time did he ever say of any one of his disciples or even of his dear mother, the virgin, that what they had done must be spoken of as a part of the gospel. But here he says, what Mary did is a part of the gospel story and must be told everywhere the gospel is preached throughout the world. Now that raises a problem immediately because I've been an Adventist now for 55 years. I can't remember ever hearing an evangelistic series that included, as one of the topics, Mary Magdalene's story. This isn't that. And yet, it is an essential part of the gospel, and the words of Jesus mean nothing unless they tell us clearly that we cannot have an adequate understanding of the gospel unless we consider and understand what this woman did. Now, each of the four gospels tells the story. They would have to, after Jesus said this, you see. 
Matthew tells us, this is Mark, and then John tells us. And Luke also tells us, but in a different position in his gospel. And there are some commentators who take the position that what Luke tells in St. Luke chapter 7 is not the same story. It tells about an anointing, yes. Someone anointed him and washed his feet with tears and all that. They say it's somebody else, not the woman here. However, it's very, very unlikely that could be the case. Because for one thing, Luke, having uh, done very thorough research in writing his gospel, even to the point of interviewing the Virgin Mary and other key um, characters in the gospel to get the story from them, he would doubtless have heard what Jesus had said. Then possibly couldn't have heard it, you see. And Luke would not dare to write a gospel and not include the story, would he? If he would, he'd be making a fool of himself because the Lord said, wherever the gospel's preached, this must be told. And Luke is writing a gospel. How on earth could Luke write a gospel and not include the story? Therefore, I think that's conclusive evidence that Luke chapter 7 is telling the same story. And all the details fit perfectly, so there is no problem whatever. And there are commentators who agree that that is the case. And the book, The Desire of Ages, takes that position very clearly. Now, in each of the four Gospels, the story is told a little differently so that all the details come together in perfect harmony. And you have to get something from each of the four Gospels to put the whole story together and then it comes out clear and plain. For example, John tells us that this woman was indeed Mary. And um, then um, in Mark chapter 16, Mark tells us that Mary had had seven devils cast out of her. This is John chapter 12, by the way, where you find it in the Gospel of John. And um, he identifies this lady as Mary the sister of Martha and the sister of Lazarus. And John is the one who tells us that the one who started the complaint was the great Judas Iscariot, you know, tallest, most handsome of all the twelve disciples, the born leader, the man whom everybody among the disciples expected would surely become the prime minister of the kingdom, highly respected. And the others who did the complaining were the disciples who followed Judas' lead. Putting all these details together, we come up with really a most interesting story. Mary came from a good home. Bethany was one of the best suburbs of Jerusalem. Her sister Martha was uh, a hostess with the most of you might say, the kind of a lady who wants everything just right, not a speck of dust anywhere, and every little doily perfectly in place, and everything perfectly organized. And when she had guests come for a meal, she really cooked up a storm getting ready for those guests, really doing everything super duper nice. And that would indicate that the home, of course, was a very nice home. And Martha was also asked to the hostess at a certain party. We'll hear about later in our story today. Well, coming from this very nice home, Mary undoubtedly had the very best of, of, um, of a background, you see. And all went well, and she had no reason to be anything but a very happy Jewish girl until a tragedy took place. There was a certain clergyman who apparently was a Don Juan in sheep's clothing, a wolf in sheep's clothing. And sad to say, the breed has not become extinct even today. And this clergyman, his name was Simon the Pharisee, seduced Mary. That was bad. And as soon as he had seduced her, he dropped her like a hot potato and abandoned her. And that hurt badly. 
having come from such a nice home with obviously high ideals, for her now to realize that she'd been seduced and then had been abandoned, just absolutely crushed, Mary. And she couldn't handle it. There was no one to talk to. Her seducer was himself a clergyman. She could not get pastoral counseling or psychiatric help anywhere. And so she ran away from home. And she ran away to Galilee, a little town called Magdala. And there she apparently took a nosedive and threw herself away. Here was nothing going nowhere. And she threw herself away until the sordid spirit of the abyss beclouded her mind and her soul and took possession of her. Recently, I read a most interesting book by an Indo endocrinologist, Dr. Dr. Greenblatt, Robert Greenblatt, entitled Search the Scriptures. And his, his being an endocrinologist, he told a number of Bible stories from the standpoint of a, of a medical doctor. And he said he thought that Mary was an implomaniac, a lady who could never say no to anybody. And the poor girl became a basket case and lost control of herself completely. And I've known people like that, perhaps you have. They can't control their spirit, they can't control their temper, they can't control their passions, they're just absolutely at loose ends. And that was Mary. And then it chanced that she met a man like she'd never met before. A man who obviously had no selfish interest in her, and yet he cared for her soul. And Jesus became a friend to her and prayed for her recovery. Now, all these details are in the Bible, really. Even this matter of Simon being the one who, who seduced uh, Mary, I used to wonder, uh, where is that in the Bible? It's in the Desire of Ages, you know. I used to wonder, well, where could you find that in the Bible? And in talking with the Africans about it, I suddenly saw it. I'll show you a little later where it is. It's very obvious. And Jesus prayed for her once, and she was healed. Marvelous. She was a new woman. And then temptation came. And she fell. And no fall hurts as bad as the one that comes after you think you're safe. And she was devastated again. And again the Savior prayed for her. And this went on, we're told, for seven times. It was not that there were seven devils all cast out at one time. You may think that as you read the story in the Bible, but in fact, it was a progression, a repetition, another falling, another prayer season, and no prayer could help her like a prayer of Jesus. It worked better than any psychiatrist talking to And I can imagine the disciples losing all patience. Master, why waste your time on that silly woman? She's had it. She's a basket case. You can't save everybody. Let her go, you know. But again, he prayed for her. And this time it worked. When the seventh devil was cast out, she was set free, fully and completely, in possession of her mind, her soul was clean. She was really ecstatically happy, and permanently so. Well, <clears throat> you can't blame her for wanting to say thank you somehow to the Lord. He'd saved us all. And being a woman and being of a very sensitive mind, she'd picked up something that Peter, James, and John and all the rest had been too 
dull to catch. She'd heard Jesus express some pretty broad hints to the effect that he's going to die. And that was bad. Anyway, he'd said so. And so she thought, I'm a woman. There's not much I can do. I can't preach. I can't say anything. At least I could anoint his body when he's buried. That I could do. And so she would go out and she'd buy some of this ointment for anointing a dead body. And I, I can almost imagine her going to some little shop to buy it. And the shopkeeper looks at her and knows who she is and says, well, you know, you're just in good luck today. I'm having a sale. I got some ointment here uh, for a very special low price. Special bargain. You can get it for a hundred dinars. Well, she's about to buy it. She said, anything better than this? Well, yes, I don't think you want it, though, because it's for rich people. Uh, it would cost you 200 dinars. That's what I want. She said, let me have it. She's about to pay. And then she says, hey, you got anything better than this? They said, well, Mary, what on earth are you thinking about? Who's this for? Yes, I do have one precious alabaster bottle of ointment that's imported from the Himalaya mountains in India. It's come on the backs of camels for thousands of miles through countless custom posts where they've had to pay custom duty on it. And there's been graft all along the way and uh, toll fees along the highway and so on. The price is enormous now. Why, it's for the great pilot, the governor, if he ever dies, or for King Herod, perhaps, or maybe who knows, the great Caesar across the sea there. No, Mary, you couldn't buy this. That'll cost you 300 denies. That's what I want you to do. Anyhow. She paid the price. Took every cent she had, probably. She got it. She took it home. She thought, now I'll just wait till the time comes. The longer she waited, the more impatient she felt. This is no good anointing his dead body. You'll never know that. That doesn't make sense. Is there a better way to do this? What can I do? Then it happened that the great Simon the Pharisee was throwing a party in honor of Jesus. I need to back up a little bit in our story now. This might surprise some of the women, but the fact is that when a man seduces a woman and then abandons her, he feels bad too. He's got a conscience deep inside. He may not show it. He may put on a brave outward front and smile and everything else, but deep inside something's eating out his soul. And Simon felt terrible. He had wrecked this woman and driven her to hell. He didn't know what to do. He couldn't sleep nights. And the more you put on this brave front, you know, and you try to smile in front of people and try to slap people's backs and shake hands and carry on as though nothing happened, the more of a hypocrite you feel yourself to be inside. The deeper your pollution appears to you. And you're absolutely in a horrible state. And you can get sick over things like that. Because the weakest organ of your body can break down somewhere. And sure enough, Simon got sick. He fell victim to the most dreaded disease that people knew of in the Middle East, and that was leprosy. He had to be kicked out of his home, pushed off with the leper colony, and he felt devastated, a wrecked and ruined man for all time, and now he was living under the curse of God. That's what leprosy was. And then Simon happened to be Jesus, of all people. And in kindness, Jesus healed him of his leprosy. A lot of them were healed. You don't read about in the Gospels. Sometimes he'd pass through whole villages and leave no one sick behind. And so Simon, of course, was happy. He'd been healed. He wasn't about to confess that Jesus was the Messiah. No way. He was a Pharisee. He wouldn't do a thing like that.
but he was at least grateful to Jesus for having healed him. And you've got to be decent, you know. And that means you've got to say thank you somehow for being healed. And so Simon cooked up the idea of having a party in honor of Jesus. And his disciples were invited as well. And so Simon would just simply, uh, by this means, you know, express his gratitude for the healing, and that would be finished. He would have done his duty, and that was that. And among the guests that he invited, there was one that he didn't want to come. She crashed the gate, and that was Mary. Hearing about the party, she suddenly got a bright idea. Rather than keep this ointment until Jesus should die and be buried, why not come and anoint him now while he's living? Great idea. So she comes. She presses in, perhaps unseen, into the dining room where the people are all gathered around the tables at the feast, reclining at the tables. There's a hum and a buzz of conversation. And Mary just presses in, unseen, unheard, till she comes to where Jesus is. And then impulsively, she breaks this alabaster box or bottle or flask of this precious, oint precious ointment and pours it over his head and over his feet and it starts running to waste all over the floor in between the flagstones and the cracks and the fragrance just fills the room. It's very precious ointment and you just couldn't carry on your conversation with this fragrance filling the room. Everybody stops and looks around. What's happened? What's going on? And they see this ointment running on the floor, and they look, and there they see that woman over there. By this time, she's kneeling down at Jesus' feet, and the hot tears are just flowing from her eyes onto his feet, and she had forgotten that she didn't, didn't intend, intend this at all. She hadn't planned anything, really, and she didn't have any towel, and so she took her long, flowing hair, and she took his feet, she dried him with her hair. Everybody stops to look. And then the great Judas is scared. This wise man, this good business manager, you know, he starts up in a big stage whisper, probably talking to James or Peter or someone next to him. He says, what a silly thing to do. What a stupid, crazy woman. Why, that ointment could have been sold for more than 300 dinars. And the proceeds could have been brought and given to me to put in our treasury. And we could have used that to feed the poor. Why, that's equivalent to a working man's wage for a whole year. She's blown it. You can't even pick up a teaspoon of it now. It's gone. Isn't this horrible? You are so right, sir, says Peter. Absolutely, I agree with you. Don't you think so, James? Yes, sir. John, how about that? Yes, sir, I agree. This woman is stupid. That's terrible. Jesus told us to remember the poor, didn't he? Yeah. All around the circle goes this buzz of condemnation. Mary. And Mary has, hears it, and she feels bad. She hadn't thought of that. Come to think of it, Jesus did say that we should help the poor, didn't he? That's what he was always doing. Oh, dear, what a stupid thing I've done. This is awful. Let me out of here. Jesus will think I'm crazy. And what's, what's, what's Martha going to say? And she gets up and she bolts for the door. But before she gets to the door, Jesus lifts his voice above the din and buzz of conversation and his words catch her and hold her. Let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a fantastically beautiful, appropriate, lovely deed on me. You say you care about the poor. You'll have the poor with you forever. You won't have me forever. This woman has done what she could. 
And that means she has done all she could. And Jesus will never say anything more complimentary to anybody in all eternity than that. She has done what she could. She has come ahead of time to anoint my body to the burial. Of course, by this time, the disciples were all silent. And when Jesus said, let her alone, he looked right at Judas Iscariot in the eye. And that rebuke was such a stinging slap almost in Judas' face that it riled him up inside. And that's why he left the party with the determination to betray him. That was a deed that balanced Judas completely over on that side. And then it was that Jesus said, wherever the gospel shall be preached, in all the world, including Australia, this that this woman has done must be spoken of as a memorial of her, as a part of the gospel story. Well, there are some problems here in this story because, to be quite honest, if we uh, were to ask ourselves, not knowing, you know, what Jesus said, if the story had ended there with Judas' complaint, that's all we knew, I think we'd all here tonight would vote to agree with Judas. It is irrational. It is stupid to all appearances to take a precious flask of ointment meant for a king when only a teaspoonful would be enough to anoint somebody on the head you see for a special occasion break the thing impulsively and let it just all go to waste all over the floor when when Jerusalem probably had hundreds of poor people in it and hundreds of hungry children who would love to have a scrap of bread you know Judas was right certainly seems that way. And um, to make matters worse, Jesus defends her extravagantly. Now, if I were Jesus, what I would probably say would be something like this. I would say, now, Mary, I know you want to say thank you for saving your soul, and I appreciate uh, your, your kind thought and your desire to express your appreciation <clears throat> but Mary now please don't cry see don't cry but Mary you know you could have brought just a teaspoonful or maybe a ta tablespoonful of the ointment that would have been enough that's the proper thing to do and then you could have sold the balance for 290 denarii and Mary just think of all the poor people that that we could have helped you know uh, now don't cry Mary you won't do it again will you okay Mary that's what I would have said. But not Jesus. No way. He praises her, praises her to the sky. He sets her forth as the model Christian. And bespeaks for her the contemplation of a world as long as time shall last. Even as long as eternity shall last. And one wonders, why was he so extravagant in his praise? Well, the reason is that Jesus saw something the disciples were too blind to see. In this broken alabaster flask lying on the floor, he saw an emblem of his body broken for us. And in that ointment running to waste, between the side stone everywhere. He saw an emblem of his blood shed sufficient to save the world when only a handful would respond. And Jesus saw something else in the motive that led Mary to do this deed. He saw <coughs> a faithful reflection of the motive that led him to come from heaven and give himself for us. 
Mary had no thought whatever of hearing a word of praise spoken of her or of getting some reward for what she did. Her only motive was purely and simply a desire to say thank you for saving my soul. Nothing else. It was love, pure and simple. And that's all the motive that Jesus had in coming to redeem us. There are people who, who tell us that Jesus was pretty clever and he saw in you and me a hidden value, see. And that's why he came down here to get us and to save us. It's something like uh, me as a violinist. Uh, I've been looking everywhere, trying to find a, a genuine Stradivarius violin in somebody's attic, you know, some farmer's attic. And um, the farmer doesn't care about it. Just an old, old piece of junk to him, practically firewood, you know. And uh, my practice eye can examine this old, dusty, cracked instrument here, and I recognize that this is a genuine Mona instrument made by Antonio Federvari and restored. This fiddle will bring a hundred thousand pounds in, in London easily, see? And so I'm very happy to give the farmer his ten dollars that he wants for the violin, see? Knowing, as I do, what its hidden value is. And so that's what, like Jesus comes down here, and he sees this tremendous value in us. And that's why he made the sacrifice you know, for us not true. His love does not depend upon the value of its object. His love creates that in its object. And Mary's deed reflected Jesus' love for us. Something else Jesus saw there the disciples couldn't see. He saw the tremendous sacrifice that she had made in buying this ointment. Took all her life savings probably to buy it the very best that could be bought. She was not satisfied with the, with the sale ointment that she could have gotten cheaper. She wanted the best, absolutely. And it took all she had to buy it. And Jesus saw that that was a faithful reflection of the sacrifice he made in redeeming our souls. He did not try to find some way to redeem as many souls as possible for the least possible cost, you know. Foreseeing that only a handful would eventually believe, you might say, well, he brought his price down, you know, and, and made as small a sacrifice as possible, just enough to cover their salvation. No way. Jesus got to make the complete sacrifice, just like Mary did. And again, Jesus saw something else, and I think this is fantastic. This really blows my mind. And that is, he recognized the magnificence of Mary's deed. By magnificence, I mean extravagance. I mean the filling the measure full and overflowing, you see. She could indeed have brought a little spoonful of this ointment and touched his head with it, and that would have been a gracious, generous gesture on her part to say, thank you for saving my soul. But she wasn't satisfied to do that. She didn't count the cost. She didn't think of the extravagance involved. She just impulsively broke it and let it all go to waste all over the floor. That's magnificent. That is extravagance. What do you call that? What other word can describe a deed like that? The most beautiful thing ever done by any sinful human being. And Jesus recognized what she did as a faithful reflection of the magnificence, the extravagance of his sacrifice for us. It's almost as though you were to ask him for a drink of water. Please, just a glass of water, Lord. And so, to satisfy your thirst, he turns on Niagara Falls 
enough water for a continent of people, a world of people. Instead of giving you a glass full, he just pours out Niagara Falls for you. He made a sacrifice sufficient to redeem every human soul on the face of the globe for all time to come. Yet only a handful would ever appreciate it and take advantage of it. There is the magnificence of Jesus' sacrifice for us. And Mary caught it. Her deed reflected it. Now, poor Judas was so blind he couldn't see any of them. Neither could Peter, James, and John, nor the others. We see ourselves in those disciples. I think we see ourselves at the Minneapolis conference in those disciples. Too blind to recognize the work of the Holy Spirit, to recognize that God had guided that woman in what she did. And she'd responded so beautifully. We owe to Mary Magdalene a debt of gratitude that I think we have not even begun to realize. We owe a debt to the Virgin Mary, his mother, because she suffered a great deal. That pregnancy was a time of bitter trial to her, and I'm so glad that she had Joseph to help her in that time of anguish of her soul. And a sword pierced through her soul, as Simon had said, Simeon, had said, and uh, no woman in all history has ever suffered the agony that the Virgin suffered at the cross, and she saw her son, apparently cursed of God, dying there. She just couldn't understand it. It seemed that everything was wrong. Maybe she'd lost her mind, maybe she'd never heard the angels sing over Bethlehem, Maybe she'd never seen the wise men. Was it all a dream? Could he not be the Messiah? He must not be. Because the great Moses said, anybody hangs on a tree is a curse to God. And the Jewish scribes and Pharisees must be right. Just imagine the anguish that woman suffered. But we also owe to Mary Magdalene a death of gratitude in a different way. Because what she did and this may be the real reason why the Lord said her deed is a part of the gospel story. Think a moment of what, of what happened on the cross. There's Jesus hanging there, feeling forsaken by his father. And his soul was tempted more terribly in that hour than ever before. Satan comes to him and says, Jesus, you are wasting your time. You are wasting yourself. Look, Judas has betrayed you. Think of that. Next in order is the great Peter. You know, you said that um, you called him blessed because he understood about your cross, you know, at Caesarea Philippi. Look what Peter's done. This good man has denied you with pious cursing and swearing. Why give your blood for a wretch like that? And the whole lot of them have gone off and forsaken. Not one of them even had the decency to offer you a drink of water as you hung on the cross. Now why give your life a sacrifice for these worthless people Get down off your cross and get back to heaven where you belong. Leave these people here. That was an awful temptation. A terrible temptation. And what the devil said was quite true. The disciples didn't know. They were like children. But then there steals into his consciousness a perfumed memory. The memory of the anointing at Bethany by this woman. Ah, if Judas betrays him and Peter denies him and the whole bunch run off and forsake him, here is one human soul that was stretched outside to appreciate his outside sacrifice. 
Here is one person for whom his sacrifice is effective. Mary Magdalene, the basket case, has been redeemed. We'll never know how the memory of that deed encouraged Jesus in his darkest hour. More than anointing Jesus' body to the burying, Mary did something infinitely more important than that. Mary anointed the soul, the living soul, of the Son of God to his cross. She deserves an honor that no other human being can approach. Well, while all this is going on, Simon, the Pharisee, the host, was sitting back with his arms folded, watching the whole thing take place. And beholding this sublime spectacle of a repentant sinner, washing the feet of Jesus with her tears, and wiping them with her hair, this poor man can do nothing better than reason darkly in his soul. This man, if he was a real prophet, hmm, I've been wondering about him. If he was a real prophet, surely he would know what kind of a woman that is who's touching him like that. I know that woman. She is a sinner. Now, Luke tells the story. And I wouldn't be a bit surprised by what Luke got the story directly from the lips of Simon the Pharisee himself. Very, very likely. And the reason why uh, Luke didn't tell who the woman was is very likely because at that time Mary was still living. He does give us a pretty broad hint in chapter 8, verse 2 where he talks about Mary Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils. And if Mark's gospel was the first, then um, one can pretty well understand that Luke is trying to tell us in a very discreet way here that this woman is Mary Magdalene. But none of the other gospels tells the story of Simon like, like Luke did. And so Luke, no doubt, got it from Simon himself because only Simon could tell what he was thinking about. And when Jesus understood what Simon was thinking, of course he had superhuman knowledge, but sometimes what you're thinking is written all over your face as well. And Jesus certainly had discernment to recognize the truth. Jesus tried to help Simon. If Mary was possessed of seven devils, our good friend Simon was possessed of eight devils. Simon's case was far more difficult to take care of than Mary's. Mary had been healed and saved. But to save Simon was even more difficult. The most difficult task that Jesus has ever had in 6,000 years of world history is the task of bringing a lukewarm church to repentance today. That is a difficult task. And how could Jesus bring this proud, lukewarm, self-satisfied Pharisee to see the truth? I can almost imagine he was tempted to give up on Simon. He'd saved Mary, thank the Lord for that. And why not just get up in a high dungeon and walk off and, and leave Simon to his fate. Why try to save him too when his case is so difficult? But let's see what Jesus did. Verse 41. 40. Jesus responding to, to Simon's dark thoughts running through his mind said, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. Oh, yes, yes, Master. Yes, what is it? And he tells a story. 
and this ability to tell a story on the spur of the moment. Fantastic. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 dinars, and the other only 50. And neither one had even sent number one to pay back the debt. And so the creditor, frankly, kindly, magnanimously, forgave them both. I got a question, Simon. I'd like to ask you. Tell me, which of those two do you think would love him most? I imagine Simon could feel the noose tightening around his neck, can't you? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And Jesus said to him, Well done, you rightly judge. Of course. Then there's something strange here, verse 44. He turned his back on Simon and faced the woman. But was speaking to Simon still. Simon, do you see this woman here? You invited me to your home today for this little feast, this little tea, whatever you want to call it. And because I'm a Galilean and because I am Jesus of Nazareth, and because your fellow Pharisees have no use for me, you were scared to offer me the elemental courtesy that any guest deserves. You did not tell your servant to bring a basin of water to wash my feet. But you see this woman here? She's washed my feet with tears, wiped them with the hairs of her head. Simon? When I came to your house for this little party, you didn't give me any kiss or welcome, and yet that's a normal elemental courtesy. If I'd been a Pharisee, you'd have hugged me and given me a kiss. No way for me. But this woman, since I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. And Simon, you didn't even bring a teaspoonful of cheap oil to anoint my head when I came in as your guest tonight. But this woman whom you despise has anointed my feet with precious ointment. And therefore, I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. Now, by this time, I'm sure that Simon got the point. And he saw that his debt was 500 dinars, and Mary's was 50. That he could not avoid realizing that. And incidentally, that is the key that makes it very clear that Simon was the one who seduced Mary in the beginning. His guilt was ten times that of her. Well, this story illustrates the cross. Mary became prophetic almost in her discernment. Her heart broken with appreciation. She fits into the category of Psalm 51, where David prays there, A broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Fortunately, God is different from the disciples. He did not despise the devotion of Mary, but instead he appreciated it. There are several lessons we can learn here from Mary's experience that are very appropriate to our needs today in 1984. One is 
that the attitude of the disciples toward Mary was definitely an attitude of persecution. If Jesus had not come to her rescue, they would have disfellowshipped that woman and hounded her the rest of her life if Jesus had not come to her rescue. But he defended her. And thus we see that often, sad to say throughout history, the leaders of God's work have failed to appreciate a genuine work of the Holy Spirit and have misunderstood, have ridiculed, have chided, have tried to suppress, have actually persecuted someone who was led by the Holy Spirit. And again, we can see that Mary's method here was something that no committee, no board, probably no general conference would ever think of to do. You can't imagine a committee or a board decide and do a thing like this, can you? But Mary was taught by the inscrutable but infallible motive of love to do something out of the ordinary, something different, something magnificent. And that is how God's work is going to be finished. I doubt very, very much the committees, and boards, and councils are going to think up the method that will be used to complete God's work on earth. But I believe the Holy Spirit working upon a heart that appreciates the cross of Calvary will impart to different ones here and there the method that will be successful in the closing of God's great work. And so Mary has a lesson for us. And someday I hope to meet her and to thank her for what she did to encourage our Savior in his office. Now may God help us to realize that Mary is not an unusual type of character. That is where I think we lose a great blessing. When Jesus praised her so highly, what he really intended to say was that Mary is the model Christian. Mary is what he died to accomplish. He sets her forth as a pattern Christian, if you please. Now, don't, don't get shocked by my saying that. I fully believe that Jesus is our only divine pattern. No question about that. He's also our human pattern. He's the only one we should copy. But there's no question also that Jesus honored Mary as the first fruits of his sacrifice, a demonstration of what he died to accomplish. Somebody who was redeemed from the abyss whose heart was able to to reflect like a mirror reflects the sun. Her deed reflected the, the beauty of Christ's deed in our behalf. Now, Mary therefore becomes a symbol or a type of God's people living in the last days. She represents the church that will be ready for Jesus' second coming. Let no one say, I am so thankful I have never had seven devils. I'm so thankful I grew up on the right side of the railroad track and I had good parents and I never lost my way and I have been righteous all my life. I need a little help, yes. Yeah. Maybe I need five or ten percent from Jesus to push me over the top, but I'm so glad I'm not down in the gutter with Mary Magdalene. If you feel that way, you've missed the whole point of Holy Scripture. Mary is a type of all of us. We may not 
see that we're possessed of seven devils. But apart from the grace of Christ, Mary is an example of what we would be exactly. And the sooner we realize that, the better. Now Jesus said, he that is forgiven little, loves little. And Laodicea, loves little. Why? Is it because Laodicea doesn't have many sins to confess? You know, we're told we should confess our sins, and so evening time comes, and it's almost time to go to bed, and so we, we uh, kneel down by the bed, and we pray, and dear Lord, thank you for a nice day. So glad the sun was shining today. Thank you I didn't have a wreck with my car today. Thank you I've had some food today to eat, and thank you for a bed to sleep in tonight, and Lord, hmm, have I sinned today? I don't know. Did I do something wrong today? I can't think of anything wrong. I really can't. But if I have, would you please forgive me? Amen. What a childish prayer. We pray. How little we understand the depths of our own sinfulness, our selfishness. And the Holy Spirit, in this time of the cleansing of the sanctuary, is imparting to God's people to follow Christ by faith a deeper conviction of sin than they have ever had before. It is not enough to overcome what we are pleased to call known sin. For example, kicking the cat beating your wife or swearing or something like that. These are things, yes, you know that are, are wrong and you've got to confess and overcome these known sins. The most terrible sin of all time was an unknown sin. And the cleansing of the sanctuary must include the cleansing from the hearts of God's people of unknown sin. Sin that today we're not aware of. And the Holy Spirit must get right down to the depths and bring these things out into the open sunlight, as it were, so we can see clearly the depravity, the selfishness, the hypocrisy of our soul. How often we've done something we think from a good motive when on reflection, illuminated by the Holy Spirit, we can see our motive is selfish. All this if the cleansing of the sanctuary to be effective. And perhaps we can pray, O miracle worker Bethany, do help us to see those seven devils inside us. Grant us to be healed and cleansed as Mary does. And last of all, we see in this story a definition of something that has troubled a lot of people. And this is very important. We get it straight. It's in Luke chapter 7 again. And Jesus said to her, verse 48, Thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him at the, at the party, at the tea, began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgives sins also? And then Jesus said to the woman, Go in peace. Thy faith hath saved thee. And the point I want to make here is that this story is the clearest definition of what New Testament faith is to be found anywhere in the Bible. What Mary had, that is true faith. And let none of us ever boastfully say, like I've heard some say, Oh, Pastor, no problem. I believe with all my heart. Let's never dare to make that, that claim unless we love Jesus like men love him. To the same extent of sacrifice, motive, and magnificence that Mary is. Because her love is a proper definition of faith. 
Shall we pray? Close. Father, we're thankful for the gospel. We're so thankful for this woman who gave us a part of the gospel story, a reflection of Jesus' love, sacrifice, and the magnificence of his devotion for us. Now, Father, teach us to bring honor and glory to the Savior. We're not worrying about getting a home in heaven. We're not scared about going to hell. We're not trying to find a fire escape because of our own selfish concern. Our prayer is, Lord, help us to reflect the beauty of Christ's character to the world, to do something, to say something that will lift heavy burdens and let people go free. Make us each one to be a missionary. I pray in Christ's name.